Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for April, May, and June of 2014. And this particular series is entitled Christ and His Law. And this particular lesson is entitled Christ and Religious Tradition. It's lesson number five in that series, and it's the lesson for May 3 of 2014. We hope that you have your Bible handy because we're going to do a lot of looking in the Bible and we're going to have to see some very interesting passages and very interesting stories about Jesus and how he faced off with the religious leaders of his day. And you want to listen very carefully because you don't want to come up with the wrong idea here. This is not an, an, an encouragement for you to attack the pastor, I'm saying. Okay? <laughs> so, having said that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come and we look at your example, we see what you did when you were here on this earth, and we want to learn from it all we can. Help us not to be rebels, help us not to be irrespectful, ir 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 not to be disrespectful, but rather, Lord, help us to follow your example, to stand for the truth when we need to, but to be humble and teachable the rest of the time is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular lesson not only talks about how Jesus faced off with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but it seems like in most cases he was facing off with them about the keeping of the Sabbath. And we're going to see some reasons why that is true. Why do you think so many churches in our day worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? I mean, many languages, if you look at French, you look at Spanish, you look at a lot of other languages, even the name for Saturday is Sabado. Yeah. See, so there's no question about which day is the Sabbath. Well, they say the law has been done away with, and Sunday is the day of resurrection. Mm -hmm. celebrating, yeah. celebrating the resurrection, yeah. The Catholic Catechism says Sunday is the day that follows the Sabbath. Yeah. It doesn't call it Sunday a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Only the Protestants seem to have that. Well, you don't have to study the Bible very long before you realize that Sabbath was given to us as human beings at creation. It was reinforced at the time of the Exodus in the, in the Ten Commandments. And it was promoted by the prophets of the Old Testament. All those things are easy to, to see. It was clearly observed by Jesus, and there's no question about that, throughout his life and observed by the apostles after his death. It was hundreds of years later, at the time when the Christian church became the official church of the Roman Empire, that Sunday became the official day of worship. Isaiah 66, 23, let's just look at that for a moment. Isaiah 66, 23 says, on every new moon festival and every Sabbath, now who's writing to here, when, to whom in, in this passage? It's Isaiah writing to the people who lived 700 plus years before Christ. These were Jews. There was no thought of any day for worship except Sabbath, right? So he, it's very clear that's what he has in mind. So on every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. And if you read chapters 65 and 66, it is very clear that he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. So if, we're going to, if we started worshiping God at creation, uh, on the Sabbath at creation, we continue to do that through the experience of, of Mount Sinai and all the way through the Old Testament. Jesus kept it, the apostles kept it, and we're going to keep it again when we get to the new heaven. Why would God change to a different day for that short period, a relatively short period, in the middle there somewhere? It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you know the passages. Look at Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work. Neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the, sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath, and made it holy. Okay? Clean. <laughs> but 
What? That is pretty plain. Pretty plain. Mm. Unfortunately, there's a bit of confusing arises when you read over in Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting with verse 12, where almost the same words are found. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Pretty much similar so far. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. And our Christian friends said, you see, there's the proof that Sabbath is for Jews only. And my first question is, were Adam and Eve Jews? No. No, as as we know. Yeah, no they weren't. To be a Jew, you have to be a descendant of Judah. Was Abraham a Jew? No. He wasn't a descendant of Judah either. Judah was his great-grandson. Okay? So what are we going to do with this? Well, I would say that what we see here is God is saying, and we, we discover something else, at the time of his crucifixion, he's crucified on what day of the week? Friday. 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 And then he does what? Rest he rests over the Sabbath. He was resurrected on Sunday and all, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Well, there are a few people who do, but most don't. They disagree with the idea that he was resurrected on Sunday. So it's there in all of Scripture. So, so even in, in, in connection with, the, with his resurrection, the Sabbath is, 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 was celebrated by his, resurrect, by his resting on the Sabbath. And then in heaven, we're going to celebrate by keeping the Sabbath in heaven. So all of the major events of, of, of theological significance in history are connected to the observance of the Sabbath. So why do you think God blessed it and made it holy? What, what does it mean, blessed and make it holy? What does that mean? Set it apart. Set it apart? Yeah. To make holy means you set it apart. What does it mean? Does it mean we rip it out of the week? What does that mean? Well, in the way you do rip it out of the week, mm -hmm. because um, six days you work, mm -hmm. and on the seventh you... You worship God, you do yeah. spiritual things. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's no question, I hope, in any of our minds here that Christ was the creator of the universe. Now, when he says the Sabbath is blessed, sometimes I'll go to church or go home from church and I'll see people going to the grocery store, getting gas, doing stuff like that. The Sabbath was blessed. Does that mean if you observe the Sabbath, somehow you'll get some kind of blessing that isn't available on another day? I think you do. I think that's exactly what it means. It's kind well, of a way mark. So yeah, those people that are going around people. shopping and filling their gas tank and that sort of thing, they're Watching not... Watching the football game, etc. They're not collecting in their little life basket the blessing that is that God gives on the nope. Sabbath. God says we're going to have a date once a week. Uh -huh. I can occupy all your time just this one time. Why, why is it that we, that it has to be on the seventh day? That it has to be on the seventh day? I know you're going to give me the birthday thing. But oh, what's wrong with that? Huh? What's wrong with that? Let me because give you the I, birthday. I've had the, give you the I've done my, thing. I've done my birthday on a different day because somebody couldn't make it. <laughs> I had okay. my party on a different day because somebody didn't make it. Um, okay, what about the 4th of July? 4th of July? Mm-hmm. Did you well, get the nation changed because it wasn't convenient for you on the 4th of July? Well, actually, one, one 4th of July, we couldn't make it home and try to do our fireworks, so we did it after the, <laughs> the day after. Yeah, one, you might get one family to do that, but you're not going to get the nation to do that. And why not? Well, d did, I, did I do anything wrong by doing that? No, but you, didn't, you, didn't, you couldn't celebrate with the rest of the nation. Do I have to? Well, that's, that's the whole... I mean, what's the point of the 4th of July? It's oh. a national celebration. Okay. You can celebrate whenever you want, but people say, what in the world are you doing? Right? But, but do I have to celebrate with everybody on the 4th of July? No, you can miss out on the fellowship if you want. 
The only thing that might affect us in our time, and I stress our time with the Sabbath, is the international dateline, and it has created a little havoc in some of our missions here and there. Yeah. Well, I, it's all kinds of problems up in Alaska. Well, yeah, that's a different one again, but I'm talking about the Sabbath. <laughs> the and there's probably some problems going out to other planets, too. Well, but the point no, we is... We don't have that. Yeah. Well, well different. different. I'm, I'm trying to trying to see where the the stress is here. Mm -hmm. You know, in these days um, we have a problem with what is it called ADHD or something mm -hmm. the hyperactivity hyperactivity, yeah. and this is God's timeout. Mm -hmm. You have to sit down and be peaceful whether you want to or not. It's good for your body, and pretty soon you you start learning that this helps you through the week. Well, there's a lot more things. For example. If you celebrate the Sabbath truly, you are saying, I believe that Jesus created the world, the heavens and the earth, if you take Genesis 1. Okay, now we believe that someday God's going to come back and he's going to rescue us from a very sin polluted world and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Now, if we don't believe that he could do it the first time and we're not willing to celebrate the fact that he did it the first time, then on what basis do we believe he's going to do it the second time? So, so worshiping on a certain day does that all? It should. So, it, it if makes you, under, you if you understand what you're doing, the answer is yes. So, it, it makes you believe that God actually created the earth. Uh, what are you celebrating? Because, well, we had a speaker. What it was for initial celebration yeah, of creation. I mean, you, you don't have to. I, mean, I thought you could, it was. I thought it was because God finished His work, and there, He looked over the whole thing. He says it was good. That's one of them. What, the other what one is, is the work that He finished? Freedom. He created. Okay, created there you the go. We have, but why? Do, why does it have to happen on Saturday all the time? An evolutionist cannot keep the seventh day Sabbath. But why does it have to keep on be kept on Saturday? Why do you have to look at the creation? On Saturday because that's the day when God says I would like to meet with you on this day okay we have but, but but what if he says he'll only meet with me on that day well he chooses to meet with you and the group on that on that day you can meet so with God yourself privately any day you want so but if you want the group with the, if even the group if you get a group together on Wednesday he won't come no, I'm not saying that. But the point is, God has said, I'm planning to meet here. I want my children. Let's all get together. We've got to pick a day. We can't, be keep, we can't notify everybody in the world. Who we have seven to dad. pick a day? Well, I mean, God has to pick a day. And he, he can't say, okay, I guess this week folks will meet on Wednesday. Next week, well, next week let's do it on Tuesday. You, you can't do that. You have to pick a day and you have to stick with it. You have to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a That's why it's in the law. Because a, you have to stick with it. We had a man here who thought every day was a thousand years, mm -hmm. that short earth or long earth creation or whatever. And so the question, I asked the question, well, what day is the Sabbath? And he says, it does not matter what day is the Sabbath because there were not 24 hour days. So when we keep the Sabbath, we are recognizing that God created in six 24 hour days Mm -hmm. And we're going to celebrate the seventh with God, yep. 24 hours. It's a reaffirmation that we believe in the six-day creation. If you don't believe in the six-day creation, why in the world would you uh, observe the Sabbath? So, that, if you yeah. don't, if you don't, you don't believe in the six-day creation. So the only way you'll believe in the six-day creation is if you worship on Sunday or Saturday? No, I'm saying, That's no, it. there's people who worship yeah. on Saturday who don't believe in six-day creation, but I'm saying if you believe in the six-day creation, the seventh day will have significance because for you, for a person who believes in the six-day creation. Well, it did for God because in the commandments it says, come and join me on my Sabbath. On, mm -hmm. Yeah, on my on the seventh day that I created, and then Which you're acknowledging and it's, saying, it's his Sabbath. saying it's I his would Sabbath. love to join you on your Sabbath, and thank you for the other six days creating this. Be, be, I mean, it was Adam and Eve's only second day. It wasn't their seventh day. They were created on Friday. Sabbath was their second day, but for God, it was his seventh day. 
So God is asking us to join him in celebrating on the seventh day. And then if, if God says, come join me on the seventh day, and we say, God, can we celebrate your seventh day tomorrow? Would you mind? It just, it's like, is God really our God if we ask him to flex according to our schedule? That's an expression of self-centeredness, isn't it? To mm -hmm. make that decision, to make that choice. Well, look at, look at some examples from ancient times. The Jews, their rule was, if you have 10 Jewish males living in a village, that a group of 10 Jewish males was called a minion, if you have 10 Jewish males in a town, you were expected to, sta to establish a synagogue. And what happened in the synagogue? That's what I was going to ask you. Exactly what is a synagogue? A is synagogue a is a place together. to come together. and, and together, yeah. It's the equivalent of a congregation in Latin or a church, if you will. Okay. Yeah, that's what a synagogue is. Um, so what do we know? Let's just look at the Bible and, and see what we know about what it teaches about the early Christians and how they observed the Sabbath. Look at Acts 13, verse 14. This is talking about Paul. They went out from Perga and arrived at Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Okay, what was he doing? They were sitting down. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 44. Sitting as, in church. As, uh, 42, I'm sorry. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to come back on the next Sabbath and tell them more about these things. Okay? And then verse 44, they did, and I'm going to jump over to chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. So there weren't even any Jews. Some people say, well, the reason he went to those other places on Sabbath is because that was a synagogue. Well, there wasn't a synagogue here. None at all, but they there, went out on the Sabbath by the river and, and started talking to people. Does that seem kind of logical? I mean, because why would they go worship on any other day at that time? Yeah, illogical so, to me. Yeah, it's, it's logical. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. Now, this is Thessalonica. There, during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with the people, quoting and expanding the script, explaining the scriptures, etc. Okay? And finally, 18.4. Uh, this is still Acts 18.4. He held discussions in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. So it's pretty clear that Paul did his worshiping on what day? Saturday. On Saturday. Well, Paul and Luke wrote most of the New Testament. Thus, the history we have of early church activities in the book of Acts, which was written by, by Luke, describes primarily Paul's activities when they were together. Many years after the crucifixion of Christ and God's appointment of the Christian church as his primary agency to reach out to the world in A.D. 34, that's at the end of the 490-year or 70-week prophecy, Paul, as one of the apostles, was faithfully keeping the Sabbath just as Jesus had done during his time on earth. And where do we find a verse that talks us, tells us about what Jesus did when he was here? Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went, as usual, to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures. So, how about that? So what are we supposed to learn from all of that? Look at Mark 2.28. This is one of the famous verses about the Sabbath. And we really probably ought to see the context here. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Jesus was walking through some cornfields on the Sabbath, and this is a British translation, so we're really talking about wheat fields here, for those of you who use American slang. As his disciples walked along with him, they began to pick the ears of corn. And these would be the, the heads of, of wheat. So the Pharisees said to, the, to Jesus, Look, it's against our law for your disciples to do that on the Sabbath. And he talks about the example of David. And then he concludes, And Jesus concluded, The Sabbath was made for the good of human beings. They were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So how did he feel about that? Well, Maybe he felt the same way he did in the, as he did in the Old Testament when he wrote these verses in Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. 
Then the Lord says, If you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. I will make you honored over all the world, and you will enjoy the land I gave to your ancestor Abraham, I gave to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Is there any commandment or example in the Bible where Jesus says, go to the synagogue or church on Sunday? No. And not for anybody else. Not from There's, page one to the end? No. Well, what difference does that really make? Well, if we're disciples... Is, I mean, are, are Sunday keepers really thinking that Jesus went to church on Sunday? Well, there are. they take some verses in the Bible and twist them to try to support the idea that we should worship on Sunday. Yes, they do. Most there are eight verses in... Eight verses that talk about Sunday and the entire... There's nothing in the, in the Old Testament at all. But there's eight verses that talk about the first day of the week in the New Testament. And more modern translations, like my translation, will say specifically this is Sunday. Most of them talk about his res being resurrected on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But there's some places where it talks about, for example, early on Sunday, Paul met with people and he preached all night because he was leaving in the morning. So when he said early on Sunday, what's he really talking about? Saturday night. Well, Saturday. He's really what talking about Saturday. what we would call Saturday night. That's not a place of worshiping on Sunday. He was talking to them so he could leave the next day, for example. So, and we don't have time to go through all those verses, but you can, any good concordance will let you look up those verses without any problem. So are they justifying what they're doing, or are they, no. they just mm -hmm. kind of... There are, no, there are no verses in the Old or New Testament that say you should worship on Sunday. None. Well, that wasn't my question. Are they, are they justifying what they're doing, or are they trying to... Attempting to. Trying to shield from somebody banging the Sabbath over their head? Maybe that, too. In Revelation uh, 1, 10, that's one of their favorite ones. Yeah. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And they, yeah. They kept that's, that's I think there's a lot of congregants that are raised on Sunday that the only Sabbath keepers they know is the Jews now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do not know the older history way back in the yeah. Roman times and yeah. so on. Well, when the Jewish leaders read the fourth commandment, they decided that there was a problem. What was the problem? Well, in his pre-existent state, Jesus had not spelled out in detail what work was included as being forbidden on the Sabbath? He says, you're not supposed to do any work, period. It doesn't tell you what work is. So they developed a list of 39 types of work that were forbidden. So now, Gary, you can know exactly what you're not supposed to do. Thank you. Those 39 types of work later expanded to include 613 specific commands. And some people say, well, you can even expand it to more than 1,000, but yeah, 600 is enough. Look specifically at the 13 types of work which are forbidden. Now, this is a passage from the Oxford version of the Mishnah, okay, translated into English. The main classes of work are 40, save one, 39 kinds. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating or dyeing the wool, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying a knot, loosening a knot, sewing two stitches, tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, whatever you do, don't do that, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, can't do that, scraping it or cutting it up, writing two letters, you can write one letter but not two letters, erasing in order to write two letters, Building, pulling down, putting out a fire, lighting a fire, striking with a hammer, or taking out, taking out ought from one domain into another. These are the main class of the work, 40 save one. We're all right. You're okay? Well, safe. Today's, all right, you know what to do. <laughs> today's Jewish people, like some of that stuff is no longer plowing or something, but they don't like to push elevator buttons or turn. Okay. Uh, they, there's a stove you can buy. It's called a Sabbath stove. 
it will actually turn off after so many hours so the lady doesn't have to turn off the oven. Mm -hmm. So, and that wasn't in the things that you read, so things... Oh yeah, that, that's, that's included under lighting a fire or putting it out. Light switch would be lighting We build whole oh, okay. the really orthodox Jews now build whole new houses that that is all automatic on Friday night. Boy, we'd really Cooking, be in trouble. Lighting, Air conditioning, heating, doesn't matter. Yeah, well, and, and I visited Jerusalem not too long ago, and there's a beautiful set of, in this hotel we were staying in that had, I think, 22 floors or something like that, a beautiful set of four elevators, okay? And normally, during the days of the week, you walk up there and it said, you, you can just, okay, which, and it'll say, which floor do you want to go to? And you pu push in your number, and it would tell you, A, B, C, or D, which elevator is going to get you there the fastest? So you go to that elevator, the door opens, and you get in. Mm -hmm. But on Sabbath, only two of the elevators worked that way for Gentiles. The other two elevators were set so that you didn't have to push any buttons, no lighting, any fires, anything like this. One elevator you get in is for all the even floors, and the elevator you, other you get in it goes to all the odd floors. So you can get in without pushing any buttons, and eventually it'll get to your floor. Boring. <laughs> um, the footnote at the end of that, all those instructions, says these 39 acts of work are treated in various degrees of detail in chapters 11 and following. And I tell you, the details are unbelievable. So now, let's, let's, let's put our heads together. What rules were the, were the disciples breaking when they grabbed a head of wheat like this, rubbed it in their hands like this, blew away the chaff, and ate the wheat. Was that harvesting? Harvesting. Winnowing. Reaping. Winnowing. Thre threshing. <laughs> cleaning. Cleansing crops, right? They broke a whole bunch of rules. So what are we going to do here? Well, some might say, but they were stealing from their neighbor. Well, no, that part was covered. Deuteronomy 25, 20, 23, verse 25 says, when you walk along a path in someone else's cornfield, you may eat all the corn you can pull off with your hands, but you must not cut any corn with a sickle. Is that in the Bible? That's the Bible, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 23, 25. In other words, you can, when you're going down the street and you see an orange tree, you can take some oranges mm -hmm. to eat, but you can't take a bushel uh, yeah. basket. And verse Exodus 34, 21, you have six days in which to do your work, but do not work on the seventh day, not even during plowing time or harvest. Okay? The Sabbath was not to be made an object of worship. Instead, it was an opportunity for worship. So what things can you do? What you do on the Sabbath you cannot easily do on other days of the week? Church. Go to church. Worship with like-minded people. Worship with others of like mind. With family, friends. Study the Bible with others. It's a special time. It's not that you can't do this other times, but it is a special time for studying the Bible with friends. What else? We can pray. We can take extra time to pray or, or to study the Bible. You can celebrate with your friends. You can do missionary work. You can visit the sick. Yeah. All those kinds of... My mother can, made us do that every Saturday. Afternoon. You can take a nap in the middle of the day. Yeah. Well, when God rested on the very first Sabbath, Adam and Eve were guests at the services. It was their second day. What kind of celebrations do you think took place in the Garden of Eden on that day? I think a very nice potluck. <laughs> <laughs> I think they didn't need the potluck. They could just pick it off the tree. Well, they put the, the little fruit in, in a pots. I see. Okay. Maybe they put them in big leaves. So. Who do you think was there? God and Adam and Eve. I think there were a lot more people than angels. that. Angels? I think all the angels wanted to be there. Probably beings from the other universe, other worlds. Now, since Adam and Eve could see God and talk to God, do you think they could see the angels? Adam and Eve could see the sure, angels? Sure, absolutely. The, Ellen White says in many places that they were actually instructed by angels. I'm sure there was instruction about mm -hmm. why and the ins and outs and what was expected. So when they <coughs> became sinful, and they lost their veil of glory and the ability to mm -hmm. see God face to face, then they lost a lot of friends also. Yeah. When sin entered our world, God's creation was corrupted. 
the perfect human bodies that God had created became subject to sickness, deterioration, and finally death. We often suggest that death in our day is a natural part of life. That may be true in our sin-polluted world, but it was never the original plan of God. Well, now let's look at some specific examples from Jesus because that's the main purpose of this lesson. Look at Mark 3, 1 to 6. Then Jesus went back to the synagogue where there was a man who had a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong. Who do you suppose that would be? Pharisees. Pharisees. So they watched him closely to see whether he would heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus said, and now, now let's think about this for a moment. How long has this guy had a paralyzed hand? Did it, did it happen yesterday? No. 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 His hand had been paralyzed for a long time. Okay, so this is not an emergency, right? No. Okay. So they watched him closely what he, uh, if he would heal a man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man, come up here to the front. Then he asked the people, the Pharisees, what does our law allow us to do on the Sabbath, to help or to harm? To save somebody's life or to destroy it? And they, I mean, it, there's, you know, how could they answer that question? He had, them right. he had them right there, nothing they could say. But they did not say a thing. Jesus was angry as he looked around at them, but at the same time he felt sorry for them because they were so stubborn and wrong. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And it became well again. Now, can you, could you accuse somebody of doing strong, something wrong by telling them just to stretch out their hand? Yeah. No. So the Pharisees left the synagogue and met at once with some members of Herod's party. They made plans to kill Jesus. Mm. Can you believe that? And they wanted to kill Jesus because Jesus was breaking their law and making them look foolish with their silly little laws. Mm -hmm. I think they were worried about their jobs, too. Worried about their jobs. Yeah. Well, let's try another one. Luke 13, starting with verse 10. One Sabbath, when Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, this is another example of Jesus teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath, a woman there had an evil spirit that had made her ill for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free from your illness. He placed his hands on her, and at once she straightened herself up and praised God. So what did he do wrong there? healed her in the synagogue and it was a woman to boot. Yes! And he touched her. Yes. Can you imagine it? Okay, the ones that are really spelled out in more detail are in, in John chapter 5 and John chapter 9. And these things happened in Jerusalem. It's like rubbing your nose in it, right? This is, the, this is home turf for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, after this, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a religious festival, probably a Passover. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool with five porches in Hebrew. It is called Bethzatha. Now, if you have one of the older versions, it'll say Bethesda. But if you go back into the archaeology, you'll find out that the word of Bethesda is not used till sometime after Christianity became very common. So this is all. Bethesda means the house of grace. Bethzatha is the house of, house of olives. And this, was, this whole area of Jerusalem was called Bethzatha in Jesus' day. So this is probably originally called the house, the, the Pool of Bezatha. Anyway, that's just a technical point. Mm -hmm. A large crowd of sick people were lying in the porches, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, why were they there? Lost in the water. <laughs> they had heard that that was a place of healing. Mm -hmm. Okay, a man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Now, is this an emergency case? No. no. Not at all. The teachable moment. <laughs> Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that the man had been ill for such a long time so he asked him do you want to get well I mean what would you say <laughs> the sick man answered sir I have no one here to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up while I'm trying to get in somebody else gets there first and Jesus said to him get up pick up your mat and walk Immediately the man got well, he picked up his mat and started walking. And then something just hits you in the face if you're a Jew. The day this happened was a Sabbath. So the Jewish authorities told the man who had been healed, 
This is a Sabbath and it is against our law for you to carry your mat. He answered, the man who made me well told me to pick up my mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who told you to do this? I mean, are they playing dumb or what? How many people were walking around Jerusalem that could heal a man who'd been, par who'd been paralyzed for 40, 38 years? <laughs> one, one man could do that. And they knew perfectly well who it was. There was no, and they thought, okay, we're gonna, this, is, this, this is our chance to nail him, okay? Did, did the man nail Jesus, or what did the man say? Well, they asked him, who is the man who told you to do this? But the man who had been healed did not know who Jesus was. For there was a crowd in that place, and Jesus had slipped away. Afterwards, Jesus told him in the temple and, uh, found him in the temple and said, Listen, you're well now, so stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, this is the basis in which we say his illness was a result of some kind of sin. Then the man left and told the Jewish authorities that it was Jesus who had healed him. So they began to persecute Jesus because he had done this healing on a Sabbath. Jesus answered them, my father is also working and I too must work. Now I have to, I have to tell you a few more details here. Uh, they were very upset at Jesus for doing this because he was breaking their, he wasn't breaking the rule, the Sabbath rules from the Old Testament, but he was make, breaking their rules about keeping the Sabbath. And he was making them look foolish. He was breaking their Mishnah rules? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when he said, my father is also working and I too must work, the way it's expressed, now we know Jesus was speaking, and they were speaking Aramaic. Mm -hmm. We don't have the Aramaic, but we do have the Greek. And the way the Greek is put, it, it means when he said this, is that he is equal with the Father. Which was blasphemy. <laughs> this saying made the Jewish authorities all the more determined to kill him. Not only had he broken the Sabbath law, but he had said that God was his own Father, and in this way had made himself equal to God. So. They say, if you, if you don't know the Greek, if you don't understand what happens, it was over there, I'll spell it out for you. So even though Jesus was healing, their jealousy and anger was so deep that they wanted the man who could heal dead. Mm -hmm. You would think that they would want to make Jesus their friend and, and, and keep him around. It really pointed out the hypocrisy because not one of them they all had to have been animal owners. If some one of the animals had gotten into a hole or if it fallen into the water hole or whatever, of course. they'd have made darn sure the animal got out, but you couldn't yeah. do that to a person. Well, now look at the other example. John 9, verse, starting with verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? Jesus answered, his blindness has nothing to do with his sin or his parents' sin. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. Now, it doesn't mean that God made him blind so he could heal him. It means that now that he is blind, God's power can be seen in him. As long as it is day, we must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground made some mud with a spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and said, go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means sent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back seeing. Now, what's going on here? Jesus could have healed that man without making the mud and putting it on the man's eyes. So he healed a lot of blind people without do, just by just saying the word. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here? On the Sabbath day deal. Picked up <laughs> dirt and mixed it up, put it on. <laughs> well, wasn't okay, remember we, one of the things you weren't supposed to do was knead? Oh. Yeah. He was kneading. Yeah, it was the Sabbath day. <laughs> so yeah. he, Jesus went out of his way to do something that was in the Mishnah to say, hey, these rules are not really Sabbath yep. rules. And they couldn't really argue with him because where was this power coming from? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was that really upset them. Yeah. Because here was a guy, everybody is celebrating because this guy has been blind for his whole life, and now all of a sudden he can see, and everybody's celebrating and they're angry. Mm -hmm. 
And, and they kept asking him, tell us who, tell us who, why, how did he do this? They were hoping to get something they could use against Jesus. And finally the guy says, do you want to become his disciples too? And they said, <laughs> and they threw him out of the synagogue. They were divided. He, they knew that they were in an impossible situation yeah. for and against. So Jesus intentionally, think about this, Jesus intentionally performed those miracles to raise questions about who had authority to say what should be done on the Sabbath. Jesus knew where these Sabbath, those Sabbath restrictions had come from. And here are some shocking words from Ellen White. Page, Desire of Ages, page 205, paragraph 2. Something maybe you have forgot, hadn't realized before or maybe didn't pick it up. But the plans which these rabbis were working so zealously to fulfill originated in another council than that of the Sanhedrin. After Satan had failed to overcome Christ in the wilderness, when was that? After his baptism. After his baptism. Okay. He combined his forces to oppose him in his ministry and, if possible, to thwart his work. What he could not accomplish by direct personal effort, he determined to effect by strategy. No sooner had he withdrawn from the conflict in the wilderness than in counsel with his confederate angels, he matured his plans for still further blinding the minds of the Jewish people that they might not recognize their Redeemer. He planned to work through his human agencies in the religious world by imbuing them with his own enmity against the champion of truth. He would lead them to reject Christ and to make his life as bitter as possible, hoping to discourage him in his mission. And the leaders in Israel became instruments of Satan in warring against the Savior. Wow. I'm not going to take long in this, but let me just point out three things that are very significant in understanding the life and death of Jesus. Satan had three things in mind that he wanted to accomplish during the life and death of Jesus. This is Satan's goals. Of course, the first thing, his, plan, his first plan was to get Jesus to sin. He said, man, if I can get him to sin, it's all over. And it would have been. If Jesus had sinned, the whole thing would have fallen apart. He failed to do that. So he said, well, if I can't get him to sin, I'll make it, his life so tough and so difficult that he'll, he'll just say it's not worth it, and he'll leave and go back to heaven. Not a sin, but just for abandon the project. Okay? That was his second plan. He failed in that one. His third plan didn't happen until at the crucifixion. When he, when he was buried in that grave, Satan said to all his angels, okay, we are going to keep him in that grave. We are not going to let him get out. And when the two angels came down from heaven, Satan and his angels, with, power, with God's power, they just scattered. There's nothing they could do to prevent. All that you can read in Desire of Ages. So here's an example. He, 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 he would lead them to reject Christ and to make his life as bitter as possible, hoping to discourage him in his mission. What's he trying to do? Get him to give up, number two, right? Get him to give up and go back to heaven. Well, in light of this fact, Jesus had a special purpose in mind. So how, what is Jesus' response? He had come to free the Sabbath from those burdensome requirements that had made it a curse instead of a blessing. For this reason, he had chosen the Sabbath upon which to perform the act of healing at Bethesda, or Bethsath, as we mentioned. He could have healed the sick man as well on any other day of the week, we know that, or he might simply have cured him without bidding him bear away his bed. But this would not have given him the opportunity he desired. What is he trying to do? A wise purpose underlay every act of Christ's life on earth. Everything he did was important in itself and in its teaching. Among the afflicted ones at the pool, he selected the worst case upon whom to exercise his healing power and bade the man carry his bed through the city in order to publish the great work that had been accomplished, uh, that had been wrought upon him. This would raise the question of what was lawful to do on the Sabbath and to open the way for him to denounce the restrictions of the Jews in regard to the Lord's day and to declare their traditions void. Hmm. Jesus was intentionally picking a fight. <laughs> Those three things... Desire of Ages 206, paragraph 2, yes. 
those three things that Satan was trying to get Jesus to do. Uh, in our lives, is Satan also, number one, try to get us to sin. Yes. Number two, try to get us to give up on God, yes. give up on our Christianity, right. walk away. And number three, to try to keep us in the grave. Yes. And exactly. if we stay close to God, we will start to eliminate sin. We won't give up and we will pop out of the grave. That's right. Exactly. Oh. Well, in our day, is it easy to distinguish between which are God's rules and which are man's additions? No, it's What not. if you were raised as a Roman Catholic? Mm. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think about... And I'm not trying to make fun of them. I, oh, we could have picked any other group yeah. of... Any we other don't group. think about our rules. We kind of are on autopilot and we do them. And we really don't think about the basis for the rule. Yeah. Well, in healing the man at the pool of Bethesda, or Bethesda, Jesus was accomplishing something else as well. There was no valid reason whatsoever for the man to be there at the pool of Bethesda, or Bethesda. Certainly, our intelligent, wise, and fair God would not send an angel down from time to time to stir the waters of that pool so that there could be some kind of race to get in. There was nothing more, that was nothing more than a pagan tradition. Well, the Bible says that. Well, it's probably his only hope, he thought. The Bible it says that an angel... It turns out that that piece that, where it says that was an addition that someone put in later. It wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. And it, it's put in there so that people know, under, will understand why people were there. I mean, why are they there? Because they oh. think the angel is going to stir the water. That was their thinking of the day, even thinking. though it wasn't true. Not true. So if we worship on the Sabbath to recognize God's creative and recreative abilities, we are also recognizing his power to make us new. See, if you don't believe God could create in the beginning, and then you're not so sure about whether he can recreate, then what are the chances he can recreate me? The work of the Holy Spirit on the human mind and heart is a creative work. All God asks is that we give him the op an opportunity to do that work. What choices are we making on a day-by-day -day basis that gives the Holy Spirit that opportunity? What do we have to do to give God a chance? A little bit of time and attention. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, the more time and attention we give God, the more interesting it becomes and the more we want to do it. Well, look back at John 9 again. Which rules, we read you the list of rules, which rules did Jesus break by spitting on the ground, mixing mud or clay, placing it on the man's eyes and sending him to the pool of Siloam to be healed? Well, we mentioned one already. What was that one? The needy one. The needy. He, he, he needed the spit in the, in the dirt to make a little clay. Anything else? Well, it turns out if you read the Mishnah, it was forbidden to put any medicine on your body above your neck. Mm. So where did he put the medicine? On the eyes. On the man's eyes. Do you think he intentionally chose eyes? Yes. Of course he did. Oh. Furthermore, you weren't supposed to use any particular medicinal aids on the Sabbath. So Jesus said, let me just read you these. This is from uh, the SDA Bible commentary. The preparation of the clay doubtless came within the restrictions of rabbinical laws with regard to the Sabbath. Kneading was specifically forbidden. We, we read that. For example, men were permitted to pour water on bran in preparation as feed for animals, but they were not permitted to mix it. Okay? So if you, 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 you have some bran, you're feeding it to your horses or your cows, you can pour water on it so it's, it's because dry bran is pretty hard to eat, even for a horse. But if you pour water on it, it makes it a lot more palatable. Okay? Great idea. But you're not allowed to mix it up for them on the Sabbath. You can pour the water on, but you can't mix it up. Uh, thus it was permitted to feed one's animals in a certain way on the Sabbath, but not to heal a human being on the Sabbath. 
Well, well, you know, I, I this reminds me of when I was a kid. Um, it, it seemed to me like everybody just believed that the Sabbath was a day you weren't supposed to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, so don't work on that day. Keep your toys down in the basement. Don't wash, watch TV. Don't listen to the radio. I don't remember reading so, in the Bible about basements. Well. <laughs> You know, it was just, uh, you go downstairs, if you have an electric train down there, you'd probably b build um, bridges and things like that. You couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all I could see when I was a kid. Don't work on that day. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that whole Mishnah thing is just echoing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, there are some incredible rules in the Mishnah. I, if we had time, I would I would have, I would read some of them to you. Um, I want to read. Use a towel after yeah. bath and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, look at this. Um, it's interesting to you know that. Let me just read the context here first of all. Look at um, Luke four and look at uh, the, the. Then Jesus went to Nazareth when he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scripture and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He is to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Period. Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the, to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. As he said that to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. Now, he's already made two huge problems for their thinking. What were they? The first one is he failed to read the last part of verse 2 in Isaiah 61. And the part they liked the best was... Rid of the oppressor. Yeah, to, to, to destroy the oppressor, to rise up against the oppressor, to throw out the enemy. Which That's the part true. they... What? It was still true, but not the way they were thinking. Well, so that's the part. He wanted to focus on the rest of it. He didn't want to focus on trying to fight their enemies. So that was his first mistake. What was the next problem? The end of verse, tw well, verse 21. This passage of Scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. What's he saying? I'm the Messiah. Yeah. I am the Messiah. But I don't think they got it. <laughs> Well, they were all well, well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words that he spoke. They said, isn't he the son of Joseph? Yeah, they queried it. He said to them, I am sure that you will quote this prophet to me, Dr. Hill, yourself, and so forth. I'm going to drop down because we're running out of time. And then he gets to verse 25. Listen to me, it is true that there were many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah where there was no rain for three and a half years and a severe famine spread throughout the whole land. Yet Elijah was not sent to anyone in Israel but only to a widow living in Zarephath in the territory of Sidon. And there were many people suffering from a dreaded skin disease who lived in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, yet not one of them was healed but only Naaman the Syrian. And what, what did that tell them? You're not special? Well, you're not as special as you think you are. Yeah. And that, when the or, people in the synagogue heard this, they were filled with anger. They rose up and dragged Jesus out of town, took him to the top of the hill on which their town was built. They meant to throw him off the cliff, but he walked through the middle of the crowd and went his way. And I have a picture of that hill, and indeed it drops right off. Mm. Yeah. But there's something else I thought was interesting. They asked Jesus to stand up to, to read the scriptures. Look at this very interesting passage. Um, the atmosphere of... Uh, um, well, let's start at the top of the paragraph here. I hope this is a little bit smaller uh, print, but I think you can all read it. Thus, as he grew in wisdom and stature, just talking about as a child, even as a child, Jesus increased in favor with God and men. He drew the sympathy of all hearts by showing himself capable of sympathizing with all. The atmosphere of hope and courage that surrounded him made him a blessing in every home. And often in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he's still a child, he was called upon to read the lesson from the prophets. And the hearts of the hearers thrilled as a new light shone out from, from the familiar words of the sacred text. Even as a child, 
He knew how to read the scriptures to make them a blessing. Okay? But just did more than that. He went on to say the passage is still filled. We already talked about that. Try to place yourself in the synagogue on that Sabbath. Suppose you were living in Nazareth and someone living nearby stood up and declared himself to be the Messiah. How would you respond? Well, you would have to um, check it out, um, verify it through the Bible. Well, what was Jesus' purpose in doing all this? Here's something from a, written by, by a friend of mine, Siegfried Tonstad, in his book, The Lost Meaning of the Sabbath Day. Jesus' insistence on healing on the Sabbath is best understood when we see the Sabbath not as a prized possession of the Jews. This is our special day but as God's signature statement. He, God is saying, I put my signature on this day, this is my day. In effect, Jesus is delivering on the original commitment invested in the seventh day at creation. He says, I'm, I'm gonna show you that this is my day, this is how you're to keep it. Jesus was laying down certain absolute essential truths regarding his self-identity, his mission, and his theology. He followed up his teaching with clear actions, when such an important issue was at stake, he was not afraid even to face a Sanhedrin. We already talked about, for my father's working and I'm working. This saying made the Jewish authorities all the more determined, I guess we already read that. Not only had he broken the Sabbath law, but he said that God was his own father and in this way had made himself equal with God. So in conclusion, what difference do all these things make in our keeping of the Sabbath? Why do we go to church on Saturday? Do we learn things that are important at Sabbath school? What specific steps can we take to make the Sabbath as meaningful as possible for all who, with whom we associate, including our own families? Do we, take, do we make special efforts to make the Sabbath meaningful for our children? We know that there are certain cultural norms about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to do on Sabbath, even in our day. Do we need to question some of those norms? If Jesus was here today, how would he observe the Sabbath? Should we be trying more carefully to follow his example? Would, he, would Jesus enjoy going to your church on Sabbath? What would he learn? Would you invite him to speak? What would he say? Would he say something that maybe you were a little uncomfortable with, like you did in the synagogue at Nazareth? Think about it. See you next week.